arrested in the city of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 21 and for the next six and a half chapters until we get to this chapter, Paul is in Roman custody. You think about that, here's a book that has 28 chapters and, and perhaps you could say as many as 25% of them are dealing with Paul in Roman custody having been arrested and, and it covers about, uh, well it's, it's going to cover about three years uh, of, of time and uh, you know you think why, why does the Bible give that much attention to Paul during this time, you know, you see his missionary journeys when he's going different places and preaching to different people. Why so much attention to when Paul is, is, uh, is in this uh, situation? Uh, but uh, as you begin to read through it, you see God's providence involved. You see God's providence involved in, in sparing Paul's life on a number of occasions when he could have been put to death. You see uh, God's providence in chapter 27 when we looked at a whole chapter uh, that has 44 verses about a, an impending shipwreck uh, that Paul's crew, Paul and his crew were facing. Uh, but no doubt you see God making sure that his gospel uh, made it to where God wanted it to make, uh, to make it. And that was to the city of Jerusalem or to the city of Rome uh, where we're going to get today. Look in Acts chapter 28 and um, we can't give a whole lot of background, but Paul was on a ship in Acts chapter 27 that uh, basically uh, wrecked into the city of Malta. Or you might have in your, in your Bible the name Melita, which is just the ancient name. Uh, the more modern name was the name of Malta for this city. In Acts chapter 28, they, uh, they escaped, found their way to the island of Malta. And uh, verse 2, how did the natives of Malta treat them? With unusual kindness. Well, that's kind of strange. I mean, if, if you saw 276 people, that's how, we, that's how many people were on board the ship in chapter 27. If, if you were on this, the island of Malta, you saw 276 people swimming ashore. Remember, they crashed into some kind of a reef or a sandbar offshore. So they were swimming or floating on pieces of the ship to get ashore. How would you react? Would you treat them with unusual kindness? Um, perhaps this is another part of the providence of God uh, at work. What are they called? Maybe you don't have the word natives in chapter 28 and verse 2. Maybe you have a different word other than the word natives. Barbarians. Islanders. Here are these islanders, these natives. The Greek word there is the Greek word barbarians. What do we think of when we think of barbarians? But, you know, these people are, they're non-cultured. You know, they're, they're, they're savages. Maybe that's what we think of when we think of, non -bar of barbarians. That's not what the word barbarians means in the New Testament. It's just, it's a, it's a word used for somebody who doesn't speak Greek. They are non-Greek speaking people. Uh, and yet they're nice to these Greek speaking people uh, who come ashore. And so uh, I forgot to advance this uh, to get to that point. So they get to, this, to the island of Malta. The, uh, the islanders show them unusual kindness. They kindled a fire for them. They welcomed them to the island. Uh, in verse 3, you read about Paul uh, going out and gathering some sticks for the fire. And a viper uh, clings onto his arm uh, and onto his hand and he doesn't let go. Was this a poisonous snake? Yes, very poisonous. Um, you know, put, put yourself in, the, in these islanders, in these uh, natives' position. Here comes Paul, and Paul is gathering some wood, some sticks for the fire. And uh, while he's gathering them up from the sticks, up from the wood, uh, this viper comes and stings, bites onto Paul, but doesn't just bite and let go. He hangs on. Um, the, the, uh, the natives first idea was, huh, this guy must be really, really bad. And he's being punished. Uh, he, he's being punished uh, for what he has done. In verse 4, they say, no doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he has escaped the sea, we saw him, you know, he swam ashore safely, the sea almost got him. But now yet justice does not allow to live. Anybody have a translation where the word justice is capitalized? 
Some, some Bibles have a capital J, some Bibles don't have a capital J. Um, the, uh, the Greeks had a goddess of justice. And uh, there's some who think that's, that's what they're talking about here. Is that, uh, you know, the sea didn't get him, but the Greek goddess justice, uh, she's got him now. You know, he's had a snake, a viper, come and bite him. Um, but then they saw him shake off, verse 5, shake off the viper in, uh, into the fire and suffered no harm. Isn't that what Jesus told his apostles would happen? I mean, this was... This should not have been, for Paul anyway, unexpected. In uh, Mark chapter 16 and verse 18, uh, this had been predicted. In in fact, Jesus in the limited commission in Luke 10 had also talked about uh, their treading over uh, serpents. So this should not have been a a surprise to Paul. It was a surprise to everybody else, though. Would it have been a surprise to you? Um, uh, You know... Your, your, your uh, companion is bitten by a viper. The viper does him no harm. So they change their mind. The end of verse 6 says they change their minds. Well, he's not, he's not uh, a bad guy anymore being punished uh, for uh, the, his murder uh, or what he has done. Instead, what is he? Oh, he's a God. They're having a hard time figuring out who he is. Uh, is, is, he, uh, is he, I mean, he's obviously a prisoner. Uh, but is he a murderer? Is he a god? Uh, they they uh, had a hard time figuring out who this guy was. And so they spent three months there. The first part of verse 11 tells you uh, that they were there for three months on this island. Remember we saw in chapter 27 uh, that this was a horrible time uh, to be on the sea. During the winter, during those winter months, especially in November and December and January, uh, those were horrible uh, months to be on the uh, uh, to be on the sea, and so they uh, uh, they stayed there three months. And uh, while they were there, uh, Paul uh, did some preaching as well as did some healing. Uh, you see uh, the man in uh, verse eight who had a fever and dysentery, and Paul prayed over him, laid hands on him, and healed him. And as soon as he did that, verse nine says the rest of the island came out, and uh, the rest of the island. Um, you know, once, once you see one person healed, what's going to happen? Well, every, everybody's going to come out and everybody's going to want to, uh, to experience that. And so after three months, when they got ready to leave, um, the, uh, in verse 10, the, uh, the natives honored them when they departed. They provided for their necessities, which was, uh, which was a common thing to do back then. But usually you didn't do it for, uh, for, for perhaps some strangers that you didn't know anything about. Uh, but they provided for their needs as they were going to journey on. So they spent three months there, and I'm trying to rush through this so that we can get to Rome uh, and spend a little bit of time in Rome. Finally, after, uh, when, when the weather permitted it, and this would have been about mid-February, uh, about mid-February, they sailed away from Malta. Uh, they found another Alexandrian ship. You may remember that uh, Alexandrian ships came from Egypt, they were, uh, they were a major source of grain uh, from Egypt up to, uh, up to Italy and up to Rome. And so uh, they, uh, they got aboard that ship. Uh, the figurehead for this ship, uh, what do you have in verse 11? What's the figurehead called? The twin brothers. Who are the twin brothers? Jacob and Esau? Aha. Uh-huh. Uh, the twin brothers... Uh, are the, uh, the sons of Zeus. Uh, you might have a uh, uh, marginal note there that is Castor and Pollux, the, the sons of Zeus, who, uh, who were basically, well, obviously deities, but they, they were worshipped then uh, as, as the gods of the sea. They, they were the protectors uh, of the sea. And so if, if you wanted to be on board any ship, hey, here's a ship uh, that uh, has as its figurehead uh, the, uh, the gods of the sea who are going to protect you. So they, they sailed north from Malta. Uh, they hit Syracuse, not New York. They hit uh, uh, Regium, and then they made it to uh, uh, Puteoli, which was, uh, Puteoli was, was the major port of Italy over on the west coast near Naples. And uh, when they got there, they spent some time with some brethren uh, who had come out to meet them. And then down in verse 15, 
uh, they, uh, they continued towards Rome. And uh, as they got closer to Rome, verse 15 says that there were some brethren from Rome who heard that they were coming and uh, they, they ran out to meet them. Except these cities of, uh, of uh, Apiforum and Three Ends are 30 and 40 miles away. And yet brethren from Rome found out, hey, Paul is on his way and they ran out to meet him. Um, good. You're in Acts. It's not too far. Go over to Romans chapter 15, just for a second. Paul, I know that in your Bible, the book of Romans is after the book of Acts, but Paul had written this letter. Uh, Paul had written, written the book of Romans. He had written that letter to the church uh, that was in Rome uh, several years earlier. And so this was not, uh, while it's after um, the book of Acts in your Bible, uh, it's actually written about three or four, maybe five years before. And so here's what these Christians had heard from Paul before in Romans chapter 15, look in verse 30. Paul says in Romans 15, verse 30, now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ, through the love of the spirit that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me, pray for me that what verse 31, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. Verse 32, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. Here's Paul three or four years earlier who had written a letter uh, and uh, had said, please pray for me uh, that I can come and see you. Well, what's happening in Acts chapter 28? Paul's coming to see them. Uh, and these brethren somehow heard about it. And back in chapter 28 and verse 15, they, uh, they go out to escort him into the city for the last 30 or 40 miles. What do you have at the end of verse 15 in Acts 28? He saw them and he thanked God and he took courage for them. No doubt he saw that his prayer had been answered. Uh, the prayer that we just saw in, in chapter 15 of the book of Romans. And uh, he was thankful for these folks. And so verse 16, finally... After, uh, after he had appealed to Caesar uh, a number of uh, uh, chapters earlier, finally in verse 16, uh, the Bible says, Then we came to Rome. Who does the we include? Okay. The, the we would have included the guard uh, who was there protecting him. Who, Luke, who's, who's writing this book? Luke is. And uh, we've noted uh, th on three occasions in the book of Acts, you'll find the pronoun change from what they were doing in a third person sense to what we were doing in a first person sense. Luke was including himself. And uh, Luke had been with Paul. Luke and Aristarchus were with Paul all the way through the shipwreck of chapter 27. And uh, now he's there with Paul as he gets to Rome. This is the last time we're going to read the word we uh, to include Luke uh, in the book of Acts. Uh, so they finally come to Rome. What's interesting at the end of verse 16, Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with the soldier who guarded him. Look over in verse 30. Just tie that with verse 30. Paul dwelt two years in his own rented house. I thought he was a prisoner. Yeah, he's a prisoner. But he's not being put into the common prison uh, with all of the other uh, murderous thugs. Uh, it, it's, it's house arrest. Paul is receiving some kind of perhaps special treatment. But he had been receiving special treatment all along. Uh, and, and ever since we saw him arrested in chapter 21, yes, he, there were times where he was unjustly treated, and yet he received special treatment. We saw it in, in chapter 27 with the, uh, the centurion Julius, who allowed Paul to go and, oh, here we are, we're going to spend a few days here. Go, go, go and spend seven days with the brethren. How, why do you do that with a prisoner? Uh, there, there, was, there was some special treatment. There was some trust involved. And, uh, and so Paul was permitted to uh, dwell by himself in some kind of a house arrest Situation. It's interesting. Verse 30 calls it his own rented house. Who's paying the rent? Is Paul paying the rent? I mean, what's, what's he doing to pay the rent? 
I mean, has he, has he got savings account? I mean, is he dipping into his retirement account? Um, look, look, in, look in Philippians chapter 4 for just a second. I wasn't. Look in Philippians 4 at what Paul says. When, when you read the book of Philippians, uh, try, try to put Philippians into its, uh, into its context. Paul, we have just seen, finally makes it to Rome in Acts 28. We saw in verse 30 that Paul is going to spend two years in Rome in prison. In, in, a, in a house prison, but he, he's in prison for two years. While he is there, he writes, during that two-year imprisonment in Rome, he writes four of the epistles that we have. We call them oftentimes the prison epistles because he's writing them from prison. We're, we're very clever in how we named them. So here's the four prison epistles. What are they? Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon are the four epistles that Paul writes while he is in prison uh, in Rome. Now look at the end of Philippians chapter 4. One of the books that he writes while he's in prison a book that's full of joy and rejoicing, go figure, that he writes a book while he's in prison about joy and rejoicing. And you get to the end of Philippians chapter 4 and verse 18, and he says, Indeed, I have all and abound. How can you say that when you're in prison? I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the thing sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Uh, I don't think this was a casserole. I mean, I know he says it's a sweet smelling aroma. I, I don't know that it was brownies or, you know, anything like I'm not sure that 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 would have survived, you know, at least the sweet smelling aroma part of it. I don't know that that would have survived all the way all the way from Philippi uh, to Rome. But it was some kind of a gift, uh, no doubt, some kind of a financial uh, support for Paul. Paul's staying in his own rented house. Is it possible that the church from Philippi is paying his rent? Uh, is it possible that there are brethren who are still sending him support, even in prison? It, if you had a missionary go to prison, would you keep supporting him? I mean, wouldn't you say, hey, he's a bad guy. He's in prison. We need to cut off our support. Here's Paul still receiving support, uh, as it were, from, uh, from the brethren. And perhaps that's how his rent for this particular uh, dwelling place is, is being covered. Uh, but come, come back to Acts chapter 28. He goes to prison. He's permitted to stay in prison uh, with a guard who is guarding him. And uh, while we were over, well, I'll try to note that in just a minute if I remember to do that. But he's there uh, in, this, uh, in this place with a guard guarding him. Look at verse 17. It doesn't take Paul, doesn't take Paul very long. Um, he gets to town. He gets a place to stay. He has a guard with him. After three days, verse 17, after three days, Paul called the leaders of the Jews together. Think about what kind of man you have to be to do that. I mean, if you were in prison, could you call the leaders of the Jews together? Hey, come and see me. Would they care about you? Think, think about the, the authority that he still has. Think about the respect that he still has. Uh, among these folks. He calls the Jewish leaders together. Multi-purpose for him calling them together. Ultimately, obviously, he wants to preach the gospel to these guys. Uh, in order to be able to do that, he's got to explain his situation. So he says in verse 17, uh, when they come together, men and brethren, though I, I have done nothing against our people, I have done nothing against the Jews, I have done nothing against the customs uh, of our father, of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. Paul had been affirming all along his absolute innocence. I've done nothing wrong. There's no reason that I should have been arrested. Verse 18 says, who when they had examined me, you remember that uh, on occasion Paul was examined by scourging, so it was not that they just gave him a Scantron sheet and said, please fill in these bubbles on this exam. Uh, they were, uh, he was often examined under scourging. When they examined me, then they wanted to let me go. They found out the truth, that he had done nothing wrong. They wanted to let me go because there was no cause for putting me to death. 
Think about that. Paul's judges, Festus and Felix and Agrippa, what did they all know? This man's done nothing wrong. They even said it. Uh, if we took time to go back to, uh, to Acts chapter 26 and look at Agrippa's uh, evaluation of it, Agrippa said he's done nothing deserving of death. He's done nothing wrong. And he said he would have been freed if he had not appealed to Caesar. Verse 19 here says, when the Jews spoke against it, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar because he knew he wasn't getting a fair trial from the Jews. Not that I had anything of which to accuse my nation. I didn't come before Caesar in order to uh, throw the Jews under the bus uh, by any means. For this reason, therefore, verse 20, I have called for you to see you and to speak with you because for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. We've seen that expression uh, a couple other times in the book of Acts. For the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. What is the hope? What was the hope of the Jews? The Messiah. That was the hope of the Jews. The hope of Israel was the coming of the Messiah. What was Paul going around and preaching? Jesus is the Messiah. That's why he's arrested. The hope of Israel is that the Messiah would come, that what would happen to the Messiah, that he would die, that he would be buried, that he would be raised again, all according to Old Testament prophecy. Having been raised again, he would be proven to be the Christ. And if Christ was raised from the dead, what would be able to happen to us at the end of time? We would be raised from the dead. The, the hope of Israel is, has that twofold part. It is, a, it is the Messiah and his hope that he brings to the Jews. And the hope was that death is not the end. That there will be a resurrection of the dead. And Paul says, that's why I have been arrested. Because I preach Jesus. And because I preach the resurrection of the dead. Uh, which, which sect of the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection from the dead? Did I just say which sect of the Sadducees? <laughs> wow. Why don't I just give you the answer? Which sect of the Jew called the Sadducees was the sect that believed or didn't believe in the resurrection? Uh, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. Get, guess, which, uh, guess which sect of the Jews was the dominant sect among the Sanhedrin? Guess which sect of the Jew uh, was the high priest in the Sanhedrin? They're all Sadducees. Uh, at least the, the Sadducees were the, were the political sect of the Jews. They loved political power. Uh, and so they hated Paul for preaching about the resurrection because they didn't believe in it. So verse 21, these Jewish leaders basically tell Paul, we haven't heard anything about this. You know, this, this information has not reached us. Paul didn't know if the information had reached them or not. So he is trying to, uh, to explain why he is there. And they say to him, we have not heard these things. We haven't received any letters from anyone reporting this to us. But notice what they say in verse 22. But we want to hear what you're talking about. We desire to hear from you what you think. For concerning this sect, now that's not the Jews, that's not the Pharisees or the Sadducees. They're talking about Christianity. For concerning this sect, we know that it is spoken against everywhere. Back in chapter 24, we saw this in, uh, in a previous lesson. We won't take time to repeat it all. But back in chapter 24, the church there was also called a sect. Um, and uh, that's, that's the way some individuals looked at Christianity. They, uh, they thought that it was a sect of Judaism or that it was some division of some religious organization, but is that, is that what Christianity is? Is that what the church is? It's not a sect. It's, it, is, it is the plan and the, uh, the church of Jesus Christ on this earth. It's not a division. It is not a group of something else. Uh, it is uh, the kingdom of God on this earth. But notice they say, we want to hear about this. We want to hear about Christianity. We've heard about it, but we know everywhere it's spoken of, it's spoken against. And so in verse 23, there was a day that was appointed uh, for them to come together. Okay. Verse 23, they appointed a day to come together. Look at the end of what you have in verse 23. How long were they gathered together? The end of verse 23. 
from morning till evening, the Jewish leaders come back to Paul. Now, where are they gathering? At his place. Come back to my place. How big is this rented house that he has? I mean, we, we don't know how many people are gathering there, but there's, uh, uh, here's the Jewish leaders in Rome. It was believed at this time that there were about 20,000 Jews in Rome and more than 10 different synagogues that the Jews had within Rome. It, it's, it's, the Jews are not... Uh, some unknown group in the city. Uh, and so these Jewish leaders, I don't know how many there are, but uh, Paul's place is big enough for all of them to come together. And they're not just there for an hour. You know, they're not just there for an hour Bible study and up, you know, our hour's up, you know, we'll see you next week. They're there all day. And all day, what does Paul do in verse 23? He explained, there's three verbs here. He explained to them, you might have the word, the word expounded, I like that. He expounded to them, he took the evidence and he kept on expounding and explaining it to them. He solemnly testified, all of these verbs indicate a continuous uh, activity. He solemnly testified, about what? About the kingdom of God. He's, he's, he's teaching to them about the church, that's what the kingdom is. Teaching them about the reality of the church. What, was the kingdom ever prophesied about in the Old Testament? Yes. No doubt he's going back and he's pulling in. Here, he's talking to Jews. Why not go to the Jewish? Isn't that what verse 23 says? He used the law of Moses and the prophets. He used their own text to preach to them about the kingdom. The kingdom and its prophecy. The kingdom in its, in its fulfillment and its establishment on the day of, of Pentecost. Uh, the kingdom in its, uh, in its uh, uh, perpetuity as it continued even to that day and their need to be a part of it. And then he not only talked to them about the kingdom, but what else? Persuading them concerning Jesus. He talked to them about Jesus and he talked to them about the kingdom. Can you separate those two topics? Jesus and the kingdom. Could you preach one of those without the other one? Could you preach about Jesus without preaching him as the king? Well, you can't do that. And if you're going to preach Jesus as the king, then what do you have to talk about? Well, you've got to talk about his kingdom. Look on the back of your handout. This uh, Roman numeral number two, letter A. The, this, this concept of separating the, the doctrines of the church or the church, the kingdom, and the doctrine of Jesus. There are individuals who, who want to do that. They say, well, you, you take the church and I'll take Jesus. You preach the church and I'll preach Jesus. Well, you can't, you can't preach one without the other. You can't, and you cannot, you cannot emphasize one without emphasizing the other. If you're going to emphasize Jesus as the Son of God, as the Christ... What did he come to do? He came to save mankind. He came to establish his kingdom. And so he told the apostles about the establishment of that kingdom. Jesus was involved in the establishing of his kingdom. And so you cannot take those two ideas and, and totally divorce them uh, from each other. It, it would be the same. The church is also called the body of Christ. What role does Jesus have in that regard? If the church is the body, what is Jesus? He's the head. Well, how about separating those two? Can you separate Jesus from the church? Talk about one without the other. Well, you've just decapitated the church if you're going to do that. You can't separate the head of the church from talking about the church as the body, nor can you separate the king from his kingdom. And so it's important for us to see that those two, those two concepts must be kept together. Uh, you, you cannot separate. And so that's what Paul does here in verse 23. Uh, Paul preaches to them about the kingdom and he preaches to them about Jesus uh, as, the, uh, as the king uh, of, that, of that kingdom. And what was their response in verse 24? Some were persuaded. But then at the end of verse 24, some disbelieved or continued in a state of disbelief. Uh, some of them were persuaded by what Paul said. 
And uh, if we were to go back and, and look at uh, other passages, I think these are on your handout, like chapter 17 and verse 4, chapter 18 and verse 4. Do I have these on your handout? Uh, I want to make sure they're there. Because when you read about these individuals being persuaded, it's, a, it's an indication that they, were, uh, that they were obedient to the truth. Do you have this? Do I have persuaded means to be, to be obeyed on your handout? I can't remember. I think it's there. Under number, number, number three, somewhere in there, under their response. Because that, that's important. That's important to understand. Is that when it says that they were persuaded, it means that they were uh, not just convinced of the truth. It means that they obeyed what was being taught to them. That's, that's the implication there. But, verse 25, when there were these Jews who did not agree among themselves, they started to depart. And after, or as they started to depart, Paul, what does your verse say in verse 25? Had said one word. Do you have that one statement? One statement, one word? One final statement, one parting word. Well, look at where that starts. His one word, his parting statement, it starts in the middle of verse 25 and it goes to the end of verse 28. Yeah, that's some parting word, right? But what he's going to get, he's going to get the last word in. Not singular word. He's going to get the last statement made to them. And, and he starts it in the middle of verse 25. And he starts it by saying, this is not something I have decided about you. This is something the Holy Spirit said about you 750 years ago. The Holy Spirit prophesied about you through the prophet Isaiah, and here's what he said about you. Verse 26, go to this people and say, hearing you will hear and shall not understand. Seeing you will see and you won't be able to perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. That's what he's saying to them. Their ears are hard of hearing and their eyes they have closed. It's hard to see when you got your eyes closed, isn't it? I mean, I don't, I don't know about you, but uh, it, it cracks me up when I think about the, the soldiers who were guarding Jesus and how they went and told everybody that the, that the disciples came and stole him while they were sleeping. Really? I mean, it's hard to see when you've got your eyes closed, right? It's hard to see when you're asleep, except for you people who sleepwalk. Their ears are hard of hearing, their eyes they've closed. They've closed their eyes lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. What's this all about? Je Jesus, Jesus used that same passage from Isaiah uh, in, uh, in Matthew 13 when he told the parable of the sower, parable of the soils. What's this all about? Why are these people, why do these people not understand the truth? They don't want to hear it. They've closed, Jerry said they've closed their ears to the gospel. If you don't want to understand something, is it possible that you won't understand it? Yeah. Um, I mean, they didn't want to change. And, and we know that, uh, you know, if, if, there's, if there's something that in this message is going to require to be changed, I don't want to know it. You know, husbands and wives do this sometimes. They don't want to understand, or children, let We'll take it. Let's not make it so personal. Let's talk about our kids. They're not in here. Our kids don't understand some things sometimes. Why? They don't want to. I, I don't know. What are you talking about? Oh, you know what I'm talking about. You're just trying to play dumb, right? You just don't want to understand. Is it possible not to understand something if you don't want to? Yeah. They've closed their ears, closed their eyes. They don't want to. And so these people in verse 24, at the end of verse 24, who disbelieved, why did they disbelieve? They didn't want to believe. They had already told themselves they weren't going to, to believe it. So verse 28, he finishes his statement. Therefore, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles and they will hear it. Paul repeatedly made this statement to Jews, telling them that the gospel, if they were going to reject it, it's not that the gospel was was going to Isaiah 55 verse 11 the Bible says God says my word will not return unto me void 
Well, if the Jews don't want it, is God just going to pull it back in and say, oh, well, you know, the Jews don't want it. We'll just pack up camp and go home. No, it'll just keep going. His word's not going to return unto him void. It's going to keep going until it finds a soil that will accept uh, the truth of what's being presented. And so when he had said these words in verse 29, the Jews departed and they had a great dispute among themselves. You get down to verse 30 and uh, here's what we know about, here's what we know about Paul's life. Yes. Yes. Right. That's right. Seeing him come, you know, in his glory, and they don't believe him. Yeah. Yeah. When, when, as Jerry says, when you know, we get discouraged sometimes when folks don't want to hear what we have to tell them about from the Word of God. But here's Paul, and that was happening with him too. And uh, uh, you know, that that's that's the choice, and that's what Jesus said in the parable of the soils. There's going to be different responses to the gospel, and everybody has a right uh, to make. Uh, to make their decision and their choice uh, when it comes to the gospel. You get to these last two verses of the book. And what are we told? Paul was two years. Now, what does that imply? He was two years in this prison. What, well, two years implies that there was an end to that period of time. Uh, it does not say that outright, but it implies that he was released. And, uh, and we know that he was. While he's in prison, verse 31 says he continues to preach Jesus and the kingdom. Notice those two are paired together again. They're not separated, but he continues to preach Jesus and the kingdom with confidence. And even the Romans were not forbidding him. Can you imagine that? Here, here, he, here he is preaching the gospel and he's not being forbid uh, to teach it at all. He writes those four letters. There are a number of individuals who come to visit him. We won't talk about that. But from historical records and from uh, First and Second Timothy and Titus, we know that Paul was released from prison. He was free for a period of time. We don't know exactly how long. Uh, but then uh, during that time, he wrote 1 Timothy and Titus. Uh, at some point, he was arrested again, put in prison in Rome again. But that time was the last time and apparently was for a brief time. He wrote 2 Timothy while he was in prison the second time and basically said to Timothy, the time of my departure is, is right here. Uh, I, I am not going to be here uh, much longer. He knew that that was the end of his life and uh, the, the bell has got to ring. I know he's holding it off and I appreciate my friend. I appreciate my friend for holding it off. But uh, uh, we've got we will wrap up the book of Acts two weeks from today. Uh, thank you all for your good attention. this morning.